Welcome, everyone. Good morning. It's great to see uh, such a fantastic turnout on a very cold and uh, was early uh, morning. Um, I'm, I'm Kyle Murray. I'm the Dean at the Alberta School of Business, and we're really excited to be here today to have this conversation with Kevin Lowe um, and to get back out in the community after a few years of not being as active as, as we normally like to be. So I, I want to start with uh, a land acknowledgement as we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. Um, I'm also going to introduce uh, Ruth McHugh in a minute. Just before I do that, something I'm dreading having to do, uh, I have a little bit of bad news. It turns out that the Oilers, after winning last night in the third period, have canceled their practice today. I know. I, I'm glad everybody didn't just get up and leave at that point, so thank you. We appreciate that. Um, but uh, we, we have organized a, a short tour, so for those of you who want to get down to ice level and look around, um, we'll probably see a few other things. We're going to open up the room behind us as well. Um, there's, some, there's an Andy Warhol of Wayne Gretzky in there um, that, uh, that some of you might want to see. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, they're, they're not practicing today. Um, and they're, they're getting on a plane right away to uh, head out of town. So what, what are we going to do, right? You still, have, you still have me and Kevin. Go, go. go Oilers, go. That's right. That's right. OK, so I'm going to introduce uh, Ruth McHugh, who is representing our sponsor for this event today, the Chartered Professional Accountants of Alberta. Uh, Ruth is um, a professional accountant, recognized FCPA, and an MBA from Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, she also holds the ICD uh, designation and has hel held many roles in public, private, and not-for-profit sectors. Um, she, she has also uh, been involved in a number of mergers and acquisitions, both on the board side and the executive side. Uh, now in private practice, Ruth has executive oversight of Alberta's Legislative Assembly Office uh, and has served as the Chief Operating Office for the Office of the Auditor General of Alberta. So Ruth is an experienced corporate director currently serving on a number of boards across Canada. Um, and maybe most importantly for today's event, she's vice chair of the Chartered Professional Accountants of Alberta. Um, so CPA is our sponsor for this event, so we're very excited to welcome Ruth up to provide a few comments from them. Ruth. Thanks so much, Kyle, and good morning, everyone. On behalf of the CPA Alberta Board and Alberta's 30,000 chartered professional accountants, it's my pleasure to welcome you all here this morning. CPA Alberta's mandate is to protect the public interest and the integrity of the CPA profession and promote the value of the CPA designation. No one exemplifies the value of the profession more than Eric Geddes, the namesake of this lecture series. Mr. Geddes was a highly respected member of the profession and embodied the signature qualities of CPAs, expertise, integrity, and commitment to advancing the organizations and communities he served. Every one of these qualities are also echoed in today's featured speaker, Kevin Lowe, and I'm so excited for this conversation. CP Alberta is a proud sponsor of this lecture series, not only because of the connection to Eric Geddes, but also because of the vital roles the University of Alberta and the Alberta School of Business play in our community. The CPA profession is also pleased to support a new student space at the U of A in the Carruthers Student Commons. This new space will provide opportunities for Alberta's future leaders to collaborate, engage in insightful conversations, and network with colleagues, much like we're going to do at today's event. I look forward to listening to the discussion, and I thank everyone again for being here today. Well, thank you very much, Ruth. Uh, CPA are a very valued and long-standing partner of, of the School of Business. The uh, Carruthers Student Commons that Ruth was talking about um, is 6,000 square feet that we've spent a little over $5 million renovating to create a space specifically for students to get together and meet and hold events. Um, hopefully some of you will be at those events in the next year or so. And with a little bit of luck on the construction side, we're going to be opening up this spring and probably soft launching this summer. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, before I introduce uh, our guest, which everyone knows, but I'll introduce him anyway, uh, I want to let you know that there are cameras in the room and we're recording this. In particular, we're recording this because the, the topic of this conversation is one that we think is not only important to the business community that's here today, 
but also very important to our students. Because one of the things that we'd like to instill in them is the uh, willingness to take risks and the courage to, to risk failure, um, which is hard to do. Uh, when when uh, I told Kevin this earlier, but when we were uh, first talking about this event, and I mentioned it to one of my daughters, and they said, well, what are you going to talk about? You've never failed. And I thought, wow, really? Because, you know, you fail so much, um, but you kind of forget those things and focus on the positives. And I, I think people who um, have had the opportunity to uh, live have had the opportunity to fail. Uh, and so we're going to have a chance to talk about that today. Um, I also have to say, before I get to the introduction in my notes, that I grew up in Alberta. I grew up in northern Alberta, and I um, had a rink in my backyard. And so when Kevin was winning all those Stanley Cups, I was uh, out of my back rink pretending I was playing with him. So this is, this is a big treat for me, and I'm super excited uh, to be able to talk with Kevin this morning. Uh, as you know, Kevin Lowe is a six-time Stanley Cup champion. Um, he's played, this I didn't know, he played more regular season and playoff games in an Oilers uniform than anyone in franchise history. Um, he's, he's also, of course, been a coach, a general manager, uh, president, vice chair of the Oilers Entertainment Group until he just retired last year, although that seems, uh, that's, retirement seems like a strong statement seeing you're here early this morning working uh, <laughs> on our behalf. Um, and of course, uh, Kevin is in the Hockey Hall of Fame, so we couldn't have somebody who's more successful uh, in their field to talk to us about failure. So I'm very excited to have a chance to speak with Kevin this morning, and please join me in welcoming Kevin to our event. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, well, we'll jump right in. Uh, in sports, you win a lot. Can I say yeah, something absolutely, first? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> You bet. You, that's what we're here so for. So I had nothing to do with the canceled practice. <laughs> <laughs> and I weren't aware this was being recorded. So I haven't been in a classroom for probably 45 years. So I'm not sure what I can and cannot oh. say. So uh, you, you can say whatever you want. And the best part of recording, we're not streaming live. So okay. we can edit right. later. All right. Good, good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. That's Carry right. on. <laughs> So my first question, and that's a really good clarification, because sometimes we have people come into the classroom and are really hesitant to say what they want to say because they're not sure what they can say. Uh, we always want people who come to the classroom or speak to our students to give us the unvarnished truth. So feel free to shoot away. All right. And I'll, I'll get into my first question. So, um, and I should tell you a little bit about what we're going to do. I'll have some questions for Kevin, but then we'll open it up for the audience, whatever questions you might have. I'm going to talk about the courage to fail, and I, I see, you know, we have some of these great quotes up on the wall here, and one of them is, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, which is kind of relevant to what we're talking about today. But when we get to you, Kevin said he's open to any, any questions you might have, so if we want to switch to just talking about the Oilers, we're happy to do that too. So let me get started. You're a six-time Stanley Cup champion. You've won a lot, um, more than the vast majority of, of players in the NHL. Uh, uh, but you still lost a lot. So tell us a little bit about how you, how you manage that and, and what your mindset is like when you deal with failure. Yeah, I, I would say to people uh, just on that topic, you know, I played 19 years in the NHL and I only won six times, so, <laughs> you know, lost 13 times. Uh, and of course, that's tongue in cheek, uh, as everyone well knows or can appreciate. Um, well, I think from, you know, from, uh, let, me, let me talk a little bit about the Oilers and the success of the Oilers. Uh, you know, the, 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 probably the biggest misconception about the Oilers of the 80s and the success was that, you know, just blessed with abundance of, abundance of talent, which, which there was. But, uh, but all those players that won those cups were all were hardwired to, and driven to be, to win, to want to win. I don't want to say be successful. I guess they go hand in hand. But were really driven to not want to lose at anything. And um, so along the way, we had, we had our challenges uh, and, and we lost. Uh, you know, we, um, we lost in 1982 when we finished second overall. And of course, the hockey world expected the Oilers to, to be ultra successful last year. And we lost uh, that particular year and we lost in the first round. And headlines across the country from uh, a well-known uh, journalist who still is living today, Terry Jones. Uh, Weak-kneed wimps, he called the Oilers after we lost the Los Angeles Kings. 
you know, all year long he, he, he thought we were the greatest thing since Bobby Orr and the Bruins, and then all of a sudden across the nation we were weak-kneed wimps. And, uh, you know, so uh, the failures were a good thing, were a really good thing. For, and in the world of pro professional sports, I don't think you learn any other way than ha uh, without having failures. I mean, our trajectory was incredible. I mean, we went from a new franchise to winning a Stanley Cup in five years. And, um, and you can see today where teams are trying rebuilds. The Oilers tried it uh, unsuccessfully for a lot of years, tried to rebuild the whole thing and, and missed the playoffs nine years in a row. Uh, but, but in terms of us and our success, certainly the failures uh, were part of our development. Uh, never easy. Uh, that particular year, um, um, Paul Coffey and I got quickly out of town because we couldn't, uh, you know, couldn't face... Uh, we, we couldn't uh, have ourselves go out in public and, and have to deal with the, um, with the questions. And, and, and I, I must say, the, the people in Edmonton, you know, they're passionate fans, uh, they're wonderful fans, and, and we've never had any problem. I've never had any problem. Even my darkest days as president when, you know, most, uh, well, a lot of the critics wanted me hung from the Coliseum <laughs> roof instead of having my, name, my banner up there. Uh, it was, you know, in public, they were always truly respectful and more encouraging than they were, you know, a lot of this stuff, a lot of this vitriol comes now from social media, people hiding behind uh, their names and stuff and for whatever reason want to lash out. But the fans are always great. But however, Paul Coffey and I, we escaped to Phoenix. We had to escape. We had to, we had to you know, we had to chill and regroup. And <clears throat> we were in a bar playing pool one afternoon and, or one evening and all of a sudden... Uh, uh, you know, our biggest arch rivals were playing in the next round of the playoffs, the Calgary Flames. And uh, so Paul wandered over the TV, no one was looking, and he unplugged the TV. <laughs> just, we, like, we just didn't even want to look at hockey, didn't want to watch hockey, and particularly didn't want to watch the Flames. And, and so just to give you a little bit of sense at, at, at uh, you know, how hard we took it and, um, you know, how much it meant to us. And, and a lot of, you know, like I say, a lot of that was part of our growth. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Absolutely, but the, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think a lot of us don't want to watch the flames, so we understand. <laughs> but I, I think this is one of the reasons that um, your story is very interesting because, you know, I mentioned earlier we've all failed. Um, but when I've failed, it's never showing up on the front page of the paper that I'm a weak need wimp, right? So when you fail, it, it, as an athlete, it tends to be so public. And you don't just get to kind of deal with it quietly. You have to deal with it in a uh, unplugging TVs in Phoenix kind of way. Um, but I know you also have to go into game sevens under a ton of pressure and be able to deal with it even before you know what the outcome is going to be. So maybe tell us a little about how you enter those game sevens and what your mindset is like. And then, um, you know, when it doesn't go well, when you go out in that first round, you know, how does that, how does that feel when it's so public? Yeah, I think, um, and I don't know where I learned this. Um, I, I had great leadership growing up as a as a young person. I'm the I'm the third youngest of 36 in my generation. Uh, a, a ton of positive role models from, um, you know, the oldest generation and uh, the oldest uh, in my generation were 10 or 11 years old, uh, older than I was. Uh, real strong sports environment, uh, particularly hockey. And um, um, I think the leadership started there. My father was a big influence. Unfortunately, he passed away when I was 13, but left a lot of, you know, positive messaging uh, towards me even when I was young. I remember vividly when I was about 10 years old and he was driving me home after a game and I was, I was crying because we lost the game. I was a terrible loser. I just actually, I couldn't. I couldn't live with myself losing, and um, although I, yeah, I, I not necessarily, I never considered myself a loser, but I hated losing. But my father looking at me and saying, "Hey, you know, you're going to have those games, and it's going to happen. But there's, you know, you keep working hard. There's more good than bad. But you know, if you apply yourself, um, you can become a professional hockey player." And I'm, you know, I was 10 years old, and and uh, thinking to myself. Like, really? I mean, I wasn't, I mean, I was a good little player, but I wasn't a Connor McDavid or a Wayne Gretzky as a young player. But he could see the desire and he could see the, I guess, the, uh, the skill level. 
Um, but um, remind me of the question again, because I'm getting off to a tangent. I was working to the answer. <laughs> so what I, what I was asking about is... Oh, yeah, uh, Game yeah, Sevens. Yeah, yeah, sorry, Game Sevens. So as I evolved, uh, as we evolved as athletes, uh, and I was mentioning this to you on the phone the other night, that, you know, the Game Sevens, uh, particularly Game Seven in the Stanley Cup Finals are, I mean, it doesn't, there's no more pressure than that, right? It's... Uh, yeah. But at the end of the day, it, uh, I never viewed it as pressure. Those were the calmest I ever was as a player. And I think because, um, you know, Peter Pockington had us do, um, he, he was an interesting man, different cat, but um, he, uh, I mean, he brought Tony Robbins in before Tony Robbins was anyone. And, and I, I sort of take that stuff with a grain of salt. I think it's a little hokey because I think it was, naturally driven, but you always learn, you're always learning, you always take little morsels of, of, uh, of, of whatever, of the positive, and you know, for them it was affirmations, right, affirmations, and I, I never, I, I, I subliminally I did affirmations. So my affirmations would be, before game seven would be, hey listen, all you can do is your best, and at the end of the day, I know I'm going to do my best, and if we're successful, that's great, and if not, I've, I've done my best. And uh, I always had this really calmness about myself going into Game 7s, and I think that really helped the team. I mean, I know Mark Messier was the same. You know, he'd say things like to the players, you know, you could see the you know, players gripping their sticks, you're going out for Game 7, and, you know, Mess would say, hey, there's nowhere to hide out there, you know, you're going out in front of 18,000 people, but just go out and have fun. and, and uh, at the end of the day, we're all going to still love each other, and we're all going to still be friends, and, and let's just go out there and have some fun. And um, so I think, you know, uh, I, I, like I say, I was never, never nervous. Uh, I had a great air of confidence in my own self, and, and of course, we were a good team, and I always felt that if we played up to our expectations, there was a better chance than not that we'd win. We'd win. So, uh, yeah, never, never too fearful of the Game 7s. Yeah, which is probably a... a a pretty fantastic skill for somebody who's in quite a few game sevens to go in calm and, and relaxed and yeah I think two for sure in the Stanley Cup finals uh, well two as a player and one as a general manager um, when I was manager of the Oilers in 06 when we lost to the Hurricanes um, that one I couldn't do much about because I wasn't playing and uh, and uh, but really felt terrible for the players you know I had I had won six cups by then and I remember walking down to the dressing room and uh, I'm on my way down, my wife's phoning because our four kids were at the game and they're all crying and she was, you know, what should I do? And I go, honey, listen, I don't know, you got to deal with the kids. And I walk in the dressing room and all the players are crying. I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, there's no crying in sports. Like it's, uh... and I walked through the room and I thought, uh, you know, like, and I couldn't, I mean, I was sad for sure, not sad for myself, but sad for them, because knowing full well that a lot of them will never get a chance to win, and they were, you know, sort of that close. And, uh, um, it, it, you know, it, 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 I'll, I'll never forget that moment, actually, uh, you know, seeing that. And I, I don't have strong recollections of my own experiences in the dressing room. Uh, again, I guess because we never lost that much, so it was always <laughs> positive, positive, positive experiences. So, so what do you, I mean, many people here are leaders in their organizations and everybody goes through some tough times, maybe not quite as emotionally intense as that, but what do you, what do you tell the players? What do you, what do you say to people who are, you know, have been the, that game seven in the Stanley Cup finals, this is probably the only chance that they're going to have to win and they didn't win. What do you say? How well, do you, basically what I'm asking, I guess, is, you know, how, how do you help people get over those kinds of failures? Yeah, good question. I mean, I, I don't think I would ever say to them beforehand, you know, you might not ever win again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not the place to start. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry you lost, and that was your one chance. <laughs> but however, however, no question that, that there'd be that discussion uh, to, um, to embrace the moment and enjoy the moment and not be uptight. And I, I, I think uh, when, when there was a bunch of us from the Oilers that played for the Rangers, and in 94 when, when we won with the Rangers. The Rangers hadn't won in 54 years. And uh, it, was, um, it was an interesting market. There, there was, um, it, it, as, 
as Mess said when I arrived there, he said, we've got to exercise the demons here because it's, it's, it, there, there's so much baggage just around the city and within the organization that, that uh, it's going to be hard to win, but I, you know, I, 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 I believe we can do it. But we, uh, so it was a great year. The team finished first overall, uh, won the President's Trophy. We had the number one penalty kill. We had the number one power play. We seemed destined to win. However, we stumbled along, stumbled along in the playoffs, played the New, Jer New Jersey Devils in, in the semifinals, and, and managed to, to, to fumble it away to game seven against the Devils. And um, um, not only that, but uh, into double overtime. And uh, I remember looking around the room, and there was so much tension in the room going out for that first period of overtime. And I stood up and I said, I just started laughing. I said, hey, fellas, like, this is what we all dream about. Like, this is, like, who's going to be the hero here? It's like, you know, you guys are looking like you're looking defeated. And you got to think of it the other way. It's like, like, everybody's got a chance to be maybe one of the greatest heroes in New York sports history in the next however minutes, you know. So, uh, um, you know, that was just... I mean, I, it wasn't my uh, Joe Namath moment by any means. It's just, it's, it's how I felt. I was like, come on, it's going to be fun. Let's just, go, let's just go get after it and see what happens. And hoping full well that we won, of course, but, uh, which we did. But, uh, you know, you just, again, we you know, had the good fortune of playing in so many of those situations and, and I guess established a, a position where, you know, knew how to feel, feel comfortable. That's nice, Ed. And I think, you know, those are, those are the kind of lessons that are uh, useful for almost everyone. I know we have some students here today. We have uh, people from, from industry and, and the business community. Uh, and, you know, like I've been saying, we all go through this. And so it's nice to hear kind of how you deal with that sort of pressure. Because while we've all had a lot of pressure in our lives, we've, very few of us have been in the kind of pressure that you have in double overtime, uh, trying to win the first time in New York in 54 years. So that's something. I, I, I want to switch topics a little bit. and, and um, talk a, a bit about our community in Edmonton. I mean, one of the things I've admired about you is not only did you play here, but you've spent your whole career here, and you're still here helping out the community and events like this morning. What, what motivates you to do that? Uh, my parenting, for sure. Um, you know, again, before my dad passed, um, you know, Christmas Eve, he would always disappear. And uh, he was either up drinking with his brothers up at our, our family business. Uh, I say that, you know, having a good Irish family, having a whiskey. Uh, but typically, he and his brothers were off uh, delivering hampers to the, to the needy, you know. And, um, and uh, often, you know, always appreciate what we had. We weren't a wealthy family. We were a middle-class family. We had everything we needed. That business, our family business, put, you know, 36 kids through university and and uh, we lived well enough, but really to give back and, and the importance of, uh, of you know, respecting and, and helping people who are less fortunate. So I guess at an early time of my life. And then, and then you know, getting here to Edmonton, um, Glenn Saylor was a big proponent of the players getting involved in the community. And, uh, and really my first experience was with the Christmas Bureau, who I'm pleased to say I'm still with uh, after, I don't know, 35 years, that, um, you know, it was such an honor for me that, that adults approached me and asked me to be the honorary chair of a, you know, a wonderful organization. It's like, seriously, you're asking me? I'm, I'm happy to do it. And, uh, you know, um, the fact that, and, and I guess I should talk about John Beliveau, who's a hero of mine, where, you know, he had a saying about even giving an autograph that, you know, if that means so much to someone to stop me and ask me for my autograph, I'm, 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 I'm not obliged to give it. I'm, I'm, I'm just so pleased to give it and to never stop that. And, and, and the same with being approached to, you know, to do stuff in the city of Edmonton where it, it, it's just an honor. And as long as they keep asking, I'm going to continue to do it because, again, I just I see myself as a kid that grew up in a small town with a good family and, uh, and you know, don't see myself any other way. That's awesome. So w one last question, because I know we're going to want to turn it over to the audience in a second. Um, 
what advice would you give to our, our students who are about to graduate and go out in the world and start their careers? Um, you know, you, at the beginning of your career, I'm sure you couldn't have imagined it turning out as well as it did. And you probably had some, some concerns and anxieties about what it'd be like to be an NHL player. Um, we don't have a lot of NHL players graduating, but, but they are going to go out and, and start their careers. And what advice do you give? Uh, yeah, I would say um, you can, you know, this sounds a little typical or hokey, but you know, you really can do anything you want to do. You just got to find what you want to do. And I, I was talking to someone earlier. My daughter was a business student at Ryerson. And in her fourth year, I'll, actually, I'll go back a bit. I mean, in high school, she went to Skona, uh, not old Skona, but Strathcona, great school. But she was a very average student. And, um, and all of a sudden, she got the, well, she went to Grant McEwen for a year. and. Um, and, and, and loved it. I mean, she couldn't get into U of A, um, and uh, no knock on Grant McEwen, wonderful university. And uh, then she decided to, to go to Ryerson. And, and, and by the way, at Grant McEwen, she, 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 you know, she had uh, the highest grades possibly could, and my wife and I were shocked, like, where did this come from? And then she went to Ryerson, and she was uh, gonna do a business degree. And in her last year in, in business, she loved the law courses. And I said, well, why don't you become a lawyer? And she was like, really? I said, well, you like the law courses. Why, why, you know, why wouldn't you become a lawyer? And so, lo and behold, she went to law school and, and she's a lawyer today. And, and you know, I, she hadn't thought about it at that point. It was just a simple, like, why didn't you just do it? And she went and did it. So I guess that would be my advice to students. Like, don't, you know, first of all, find what you'll enjoy. In her case, she really enjoyed the law courses at, at, at in Ryerson Business, and and she went off to do it, and 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 uh, you know going back to Peter Pocklington and 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 the days of the Oilers, I mean he, you know he often said, "You guys are going to win the Stanley Cup," you know that that pause of reinforcement, and I'm not sure that's what did it, but certainly subliminally a lot of that stuff. So, you know, uh, as much reinforcement to to the young people to you know just to go out and. Again, uh, believe that they can do it, and uh, you know, but they have to. You know, they obviously have to be doing what they enjoy doing. Right. Great advice. So that also opens the door just a crack for me to put in a plug for the school, which I appreciate, because <clears throat> we often hear, and it, and it's been true that it is hard to get into the university and hard to get into the school of business. So um, starting this fall, we've been expanding fairly aggressively. So our undergraduate program historically is about 2,000 students. <clears throat> Um, by 2025, we're going to have 4,500 spots in the undergraduate program. So I want everyone to be telling your friends that it's much easier to get in. We, uh, we definitely want to have a diverse student body. We, we don't want to have just people who are over 90% averages. Um, and I, I think, you know, what, one of the things I often hear when I'm out talking to CEOs is they're, they're going to tell me that, well, I wouldn't get in today. I was, I was only a 75% student. And, so my goal is to get as many C future CEOs as we can into the school. Right? So that means those students who are under the 80% average. So we are growing. It's, we're going to make uh, some big changes in, in the program. Um, and hopefully, we won't have to send too many students to Ryerson in the future. We'll be able to educate them right here. <laughs> so, so let's open it up for questions um, from, from all of you for Kevin. Um, big part of why we're, why we're here today. <clears throat> we do have a mic that's going around. I see a hand here. If we can, uh, Celine is running the mic. Get a mic over here. I, I will say um, U of A, of course, is a wonderful institution. And I've admired it. And the Oilers have had a great relationship. In the early days of the Oilers, a lot of our advancement in training was due to uh, Art Quinney and, uh, and, um, and the research being done at the U of A. They were leaders. I, they, they were way ahead of everybody else in, in pro hockey. and you know, VO2 measurement and stuff, which became, became my focus. Uh, you know, my goal every year was to have the highest VO2 going in training camp. And uh, I was always at the top. Uh, I'm not sure, I, I probably was number one one year. Messier and I would compete all the time. Uh, Wayne had an average VO2, uh, but a great player, of course. <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, relative to, um, our kids, we really encourage our kids to travel a bit and, and, and go to, you know, to leave Edmonton and go to school elsewhere. So the, a lot of them ended up in Toronto. They have, 
ended up in Copenhagen and, and, and Dublin and, and, and schools abroad, but they're all back here working in the city now and loving, loving being back in Edmonton. Thank you, fantastic. Okay, her question. So famous sports figures are talking a lot more about mental health issues. Do you have any tips or tricks that you can share with us on things that you would do personally to pick yourself back up at times when you felt down? My goodness, what a topic, yeah. Um, I guess we've all dealt with some form of mental, Ill, uh, mental illness. I mean, we've all uh, have those moments where, uh, you know, life, uh, you wonder about life, you know, and, uh, but for me, I've always been a glass is half full. Um, you know, I've been, I've been reading a lot about it and, and um, I guess a little bit jaded, you know, I wonder how society could be so challenged, but it's very real and I understand it and, and very, you know, respectful and sensitive to it. But, uh, you know, my playing style as a leader and management style was, was, uh, a, uh, was a collaborative style, was a, a, um, uh, a, cu a communicative style. Um, and really, um, you know, that was one of our strengths. You know, we, we, had a, we had a comfortable environment, all the players. You know, when new players would come to the team, uh, between Wayne and Mark and myself, I mean, we'd be fighting, not fighting over who was going to, where they were going to come to stay, that particular player. But we always made sure they had a home. And uh, they, they initially, initially were immediately indoctrinated into the community and felt comfortable. And, and you know, from that point on, they always knew that they had a, they had a, they had a, a friend and someone to talk to. Um, so I like to think that from our years, uh, we never experienced much. I think most of the players, uh, um, you know, there, there was, we, we didn't appear to be any issues. Now, that's not to say that there wasn't the challenges. So uh, today, I don't know. I mean, you have to be really uh, respectful of, of, you know, individuals and what's going on and, and more understanding. I, I, I know that the professional sports world, I'm involved. I'm the governor of our Oil Kings, which are the younger players. And it's amazing to see the program that they have for the kids. Uh, uh, really critical to, to try to avoid... Uh, you know the mistakes that have been made in the past, and to be sensitive and and uh, to anticipate what's going on. And I know at the NHL level, uh, there's lots being done. But um, really, to answer your question, I think uh, that that organizations have to be, you know, really open to the idea that this is here with us, and and uh, you're going to get the best out of your employees or your or your players or your or whoever it is, if, if you, you, you have them in a comfortable environment that they feel welcome? Great question, great question. And one of the things that we'd always tell students is, you know, reach out to others, which can be hard at, at sometimes when you're not feeling your best, but, um, but you don't have to go through those times alone. And I think what Kevin was just talking about is kind of the support system that, that the Oilers had in place. I'll give you an example of that. Uh, in 1986, uh, Many of you will remember when we lost to the Calgary Flames in Game 7 and, and a young player by the name of Steve Smith, you know, accidentally shot the puck in off Grant Fuhr's foot and it ended up being the, the game-winning goal. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the narrative of that game became the mistake. Well, the reality is, you know, we, we didn't play as well as we should have throughout that series. We had won two cups in a row. We, had, we, we were a highly disciplined team in the years prior in order for us to get to win championships. We learned from the New York Islanders who, who had their way with us in 1983 and beat us four straight. And we learned at that time that we had to be a very disciplined team. Not just talent, but we had to be on, on we had to be respectful of the opponent. We had to be uh, ultra, um, dedicated to the systems to have a chance to win. And once we locked in on that, uh, you know, of course, then we, we walked, you know, we won two championships in a row. 
we got loose in that Calgary series as a group, and I'm not going to give you any examples, but, you know, I was probably, I don't want to say, I, I like to think I was the steering committee or I was the, the conscience of, of discipline towards the system, and, and we weren't disciplined. So it, it, it led up to there. I, anyhow, I'm kind of jumping around. But, but the point is, after the game, you could see the media rush into Steve Smith, and here's this young guy in tears. And uh, we knew that he had to answer some questions, but a few of us stepped in and you know, told the media to buzz off and said, hey, listen, it's, it, you know, we win as a team, we lose as a team, it's not his fault. We brought him into the back room and, and talked to him and said, listen, this is, we all have to learn lessons in this world, in this game, and uh, you're going to be a better player for it, which he was. Went on to be a fantastic defenseman and won many championships afterwards. But you know, I guess that's leadership. Uh, and again, uh, understanding that you know, no one mistake is, 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 the, is the reason why a team loses in a seven-game series. Although Steve Smith did take a lot of the, the blame for that. I think probably most of us in this room remember that moment fairly uh, uh, saliently. Well, and you, you know, we talked about resilience, right? Yeah. And resilience is the ability to spring back and, and to snap back. And uh, I mean, he, he uh, obviously was very resilient because that could crush some people. Uh, I mean, he had, he had a fair amount. He was a pretty confident young guy too, which, uh, which some people misunderstood. He was a good friend of mine and he was a fellow defenseman and we spent a lot of time together. And, and uh, you know, he, that's a good example of resilience because he did go on to have a great career. Yeah. Like I say, it could have it really uh, been detrimental to uh, any young person. Sure, resilience and, and a great support system. You guys were there for him. Okay, other questions? I see one up here. We're making sure we use the mics in part so that the, the recording will pick it up later as well. Thank you very much. Good morning, Kevin. Thank you so much for, for all that you do. The theme is, fear, con uh, the theme is conquering fear. You talked about your affirmations. What I'm really curious is quite often we'll find ourselves in the middle of a moment where we have to make a decision. There's a lot of pressure on us. So I'm curious from your perspective of being in those game sevens, being on the ice where who, moments can make a huge difference. What is your inner dialogue telling you? What kind of recommendations or what kind of suggestions can you give people who are finding themselves in that position? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I thought about, because I, you know, we talked a little bit about this. Generally, when those, if we're talking about business or, you know, a presentation or a big decision, there's advance warning to that. It's not typically on the spot. If you're talking about a, a decision within a game, you know, that's, you rely on your natural instincts and, and all your learned moments leading up to that. But, but when, it, when it comes to the Stanley Cup playoffs, so, so uh, a body of work that's going to take some time trying to win a championship uh, and, and, and applying this to business, uh, you want to be on your best. So first and foremost, you know, physically you want to be on, at your best. So, you know, you want to have you want to have the proper rest and the proper nutrition and all that stuff leading up to that. And that was really critical for us. Um, again, talk about the dedication and the discipline. Uh, you know, typically throughout a uh, in an 82 game regular season, you know, you have your moments where you're a human being and you want to go out and have some wine with dinner and and maybe stay up late and go dancing or whatever. Uh, but when it came time to the Stanley Cup playoffs not just like the night before, the weeks leading up to it, you know, we would be ultra disciplined, great sleep, great nutrition, much less alcohol, because we're preparing, we're, you know, we're getting ready to, to have our bodies, you know, prepared for that situation. So I would say first and foremost, you know what, you, you want to give yourself the best chance to make the best decisions. So start by treating your body well, so that it can, you know, it can react in the, in the, in the proper way. And then, uh, you know, uh, what was uh, Glenn Sather's, uh, uh, the six P's he had, uh, proper preparation prevents piss poor performance. <laughs> uh, I would just say to anyone, uh, remember the six P's and uh, you won't have a problem. 
<laughs> That's great. That's great. Other questions for Kevin? Yeah, I see one over here. It's so much of the time people think that performance happens in the moment and forget the you know years of preparation that come before that. Thank you all for arranging all. And Kevin, my question is about self-esteem. Having self-esteem is necessary for taking more risk and uh, accepting that feeling of regret or guilt. How you cultivate uh, self-esteem in the younger generation and what are your advices in this area? Self-esteem is the question. Yeah, thank you for that. Whew. Um, that's a big question. <laughs> uh, you know, my wife and I have four kids together. Um, and I don't want to say they're, they're pretty perfect. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, we had never had any trouble with them. They've all been very successful. Um, but I, 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 you know, that's again, that's a, that's a, a long process, right? You know, and, and you know, self-esteem, uh, it, it, it's just the constant lessons about what's right or wrong. Um, and really, uh, you know, I was, I was never a yeller. My wife was never a yeller. Uh, you know, just having those candid conversations and, you know, what is right or wrong. And um, the one thing I really liked about Glenn Sather, which, which I think I, I did naturally as well, but, you know, Glenn Sather never demeaned an athlete. He would make them feel really low, but he would never demean them. So in other words, uh, he would say um, uh, he would say something like, uh, "You're playing like you don't care," or "You're playing like you don't know what you're doing," or "You're playing," but he'd never say, "You don't care." He would never say. Uh, you look like you don't, you know, like, that you don't know what you're doing. Like he always, he positioned in a way that, that the, that the, that the player got the message, but it was never demeaning. And, and I think that's an important aspect. Like you, you, you look like an asshole. You're not an asshole, but <laughs> you're looking like an asshole. So you've got still the chance to correct yourself, you know, or, or, or whatever. I mean, I'm, I, I stumbled for the right example, but, uh, <laughs> and that's, that's a really, you know, interesting, like, juxtaposition, right? It's, it's a subtle one, but um, because you have to get the message to them. They have to know, they have to learn, but again, you don't want to demean them, so I'm not sure if I answered your question. I think that's, uh, you know, that has a lot to do with self-esteem, and I think our kids grew up having a fair amount of self-esteem. I actually think that's a really good point, if, especially for anyone who's involved in uh, minor sports or really anyone who's a manager, because you still do see the clipboard throwing, screaming and yelling coaches and managers um, in, in business. And uh, we, we probably are in a world now where we can move beyond that to, to uh, not demean people, but, but support them and, and give them a direction to improve. So I think that's great advice. And, and I, I would say, and. I hope we get to the point in the world where that's not completely gone because, again, I wasn't a screamer and yeller, although I did have my moments. But typically when I did it, it was, it was at the group. It was never at any one individual. And, and, and because you build up this respect with the group, that they know that, oh my God, he flipped off the handle. This is a crisis situation. When you're doing it all the time, it's not effective. Exactly, yeah. And people don't listen. Right. Yeah, and, and that's, that was exactly what I was thinking. I was, you know, the coaches that every game are screaming and yelling, it, it really has no effect. And it's the same sort of thing, I think, in management. If, if you're just constantly berating people, um, it doesn't really get you where you want to go. So we, we have a couple of minutes left if we have maybe time for two more questions. Is there one over here? Is there one over here? We've got one over there. And one over there. Okay. Hi, good morning, thanks for doing this. My question is, um, courage to fail, awesome. 
how do you reset after the failure? What was your process? Hmm, well, it, you know, it, 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 uh, in the macro sense, of, in, in terms of a hockey season, you know, you had the whole summer to reset. So um, for us, it would be, uh, again, dedication to training and, and, you know, coming back stronger than ever. Um, you know, my, my biggest failure in my professional life was my time as president. And again, you know, I say this often, you know, failure in whose eyes? Failure in the owner's eyes, failure in the fan's eyes, failure in the paying customer's eyes, or failure in mine own eyes. And uh, uh, I know you, we wanted to talk about this, and so it's, it, it, it's pretty important. Uh, in, in, uh, I was manager till 2008 for eight years, and then I got, I got sick of dealing with the agents and just didn't really like it anymore. Um, and, and Daryl Cates, the new owner of the orders, he saw it. Uh, and so he encouraged me to, um, to um, bump myself up in the organization. I go, what are you talking about? Like, I, you know, there's no higher position in hockey than general manager. We'll say, well, we created a new position. We actually, Daryl Cates created the president of hockey operations in the National Hockey League. Another level of of payroll in the NHL that they probably all regret now. <laughs> uh, and uh, of course, no template for that, um, for that position. And uh, I thought long and hard about it uh, and thought, well, that's kind of cool. I mean, you're going to pay me and I don't really have to do anything. <laughs> uh, lo and behold, uh, you know, pro well, again, the worst time in my professional life. Um, uh, took a lot of criticism and um, and uh, a lot of public criticism, and and so what what kept me going was you know I asked myself that question. I would talk to him every day. He'd phone me at uh, 5:30 or 6 a.m. every day. I'd get out of bed. The, he'd I'd drag myself out of bed and and we'd speak for 15 or 20 minutes, and uh, those were amazing conversations. He was the most encouraging, most supportive person you could ever ask for. And, uh, and he was always, uh, you know, so the night before I'd go to bed reading the headlines on social media that uh, they got to get rid of this guy, uh, he's ruining the organization. And the next morning I'd speak to the owner and he'd be patting me on the back for doing a good job. And so like I'd say to myself, okay, failure in whose eyes? Because uh, we were on a plan, uh, the plan didn't work very well, but we were on this rebuild. Uh, and, um, and, and the rebuild, the, the justification uh, for the rebuild was a couple of organizations had stumbled on that in, in, in the previous decade. Uh, Pittsburgh uh, and, uh, with the Crosby era and the Blackhawks with the Jonathan Taves and, and Patrick Kane era. So, so the, the, the thinking was that, okay, we're going to... We never lost them on, pur on purpose, but we weren't going to try to do anything to, to, um, uh, to try to make, uh, to put a Band-Aid on a bad situation. And the plan is to do a complete rebuild. And so off we go. Uh, the, the premise of a rebuild is that you're going to draft Sidney Crosby or Alex Ovechkin. And, you know... I say this in all due respect, we drafted Taylor Hall, who we thought would be a great player, but uh, he ended up being just a good player, not a great player. And so, so the, the idea of this rebuild you know, really didn't work. We, we had some other first round picks, Nugent Hopkins, another one, a, a very good player, not a superstar. And, and so uh, as a consequence, the, the master plan didn't work out. And so I had a lot of days where, you know, I figured it's time to throw myself on the sword, my, uh, on my sword, and in the best interest of, uh, of the critics that wanted me out of here. And of course, uh, it, due to our owner and, and his support of me, um, I was able to reset practically every day, but 
uh, you know, he reminded me of that this, this isn't a short-term thing. We're not trying to win the Stanley Cup in the next two or three years. We're trying to build an organization that can win a Stanley Cup in, in the next five or seven years. So uh, it's helpful when you have good leadership and, and uh, uh, you know, your boss that's supporting you that give you the ability to reset. And I think that a lot of that comes internally, reminding yourself you're, you're a good person and you're trying to do your best. and. You're certainly not trying to mess up everybody's hopes in the city, uh, and and the last thing you're trying to do is ruin the organization. But um, but uh, it, 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 it you need the support of people around you to be able to do that in in those you know those really tough situations. Fantastic. We had another question over here, but I, I also see some over here. So we'll take maybe one right here, Celine, and then uh, there was another hand yeah, over here. Yeah, gentleman on uh, five yeah. back on the left there. Thank you for being here, Kevin, today, and for the dean organizing this event. I come from a class 1962. Are there any 62 Converse <laughs> students here? <laughs> no? I think my class was 20 students. And you said 4,500? 4,500, yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> any event, I'm going to ask you about Oilers. Are we going to, uh, before the trade deadline, I know you're pretty... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I got to know you're pretty close to the Oilers. I, I, I think Daryl Cates still makes phone calls. <laughs> I worked with Daryl on a few projects many years ago when he was a lawyer. And uh, I, I know he likes to be in hands-on. Um, trade deadline's coming up. Are we going to get a defenseman or a forward? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, maybe I should take this one. May, may, yeah. How about one of both? <laughs> um, congratulations, by the way. Uh, I was born in 59, so I can't say I was in your class. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, the, the uh, oh my goodness, I was sitting with uh, Kenny Holland's wife last night, and uh, she had to have one more glass of wine uh, when the score was 2-1. and. It, 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 again, it's really interesting. I mean, it's, it's, it's the same in all the Canadian cities. It's, the passion is fantastic. It's the reason why I think the NHL is approaching $6 billion in revenues now. It's because of the passion of the game. And, uh, but it's, it's uh, uh, for a guy like, for me, anyhow, I mean, I, I, I never tried to, uh, I, was, I was conscious of what the people were saying, because you have to be. You have to get a you have to get your pulse a sense of the pulse you can't react to what people are saying uh, I wouldn't want to be him right now because his hands are really is are tied I mean the sense that he doesn't want to do anything because he doesn't want to do anything is not factual he's one of the best if not best general managers in the history of the NHL but I mean that part you don't you, you know you don't go dumb overnight um, I, I'm really fearful well, I shouldn't say I'm fearful. I, I know that they're going to do something. Uh, they're going to do something for sure. I'm just not sure at what level they can. And um, because, again, they are tied to the cap, uh, they have to, you know, the whole dollar in for dollar out thing is, uh, is really, it's a byproduct now of, of COVID because, um, I mean, I, I, I suspect most of you know how uh, salaries work in the NHL. They're tied directly to revenue. And because of COVID, there's been no, no revenue growth. So as a consequence, the cap hasn't risen. And the Oilers were already due to some you know, poor decisions in previous management. Uh, and some that Kenny has to wear as well. But he's certainly done more good bringing in guys like Hyman and, and Kane and signing Nugent Hopkins to that long-term deal, having the best year of his career. Um, he, he's done a lot of great things. I just hope that the fans are, are patient with him because he's the right guy in, 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 in the saddle. But I, he, he's done, he's done stuff at the trade deadline every year in his history, and uh, I can almost guarantee that it'll get something done. Good question. Great sweater. That's yeah. a fantastic sweater. I think, I, I think one of the reasons that you know we have this, uh, just speaking from my own experience, growing up as a as a kid in Alberta in the '80s, um, I, I honestly thought that, and and it was the Oilers, and it was also the Eskimos at the time, or the Elks. Now, uh, we just won all the time. Like, I just, I grew up expecting we would always win. And, and so, you know, I think we have these high expectations for this organization because you were so successful. 
Well, it's, you know, again, it's every city in Canada. The same thing's going on in Winnipeg and Vancouver. Vancouver's never won, you know, but they have the, the same challenges, actually more challenges because they've never won. And you didn't even mention Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> now, Toronto surpassed the Rangers, 54 years and counting. Uh, we love to beat up Toronto, but I almost, you know, at this point, I, I mean, if the Oilers can't win, uh, which I hope they do, and I think they've got a very good chance, and they're close, uh, I just hope a Canadian team wins because what really irks me right now is the sense that our, you know, our friends across, our friends, <laughs> our neighbors across the border, you know, they think they invented the game and, uh, the Canadians don't want, you know, they, they don't realize that 50% of the players on their teams are Canadians, but uh, that Canada hasn't won a Stanley Cup since, or NHL team in Canada hasn't won a Stanley Cup since 1993. Well, th thank you very much. I want to uh, send my appreciation to the U of A and Kevin for putting this on. I've really enjoyed it. Um, so I, my question, Kevin, is, uh, since you retired from playing, I'm wondering whether you've experienced any moments that compare to the pressure that you have been talking about with the Game 7s and the playoffs, etc. Have there been any sort of post, uh, like playing career moments that approach that level of pressure? And how has have your like playing experiences helped you in moments like that? Yeah, there's there's been many. Um, you know, I had the good fortune of working for Hockey Canada on four different Olympics, uh, 2002, 6, 2010, and 2014. Uh, we only won three out of four of those Olympics, uh, <laughs> sadly, but... Three, three out of four is not bad. Three out of four is not bad, yeah, yeah. But, you know, Canada expects you to win every time at the Olympics. Um, so those were some, uh, in 2002 particularly, uh, you know, high-pressure situation. Uh, uh, it was great fun uh, working with uh, my longtime teammate, Wayne Gretzky. Um, uh, the, the, uh, in my management days, no question, uh, uh, trade deadline was always, you know, fairly stressful, but again, a lot like my playing days where, you know, the, there was lots of time to prepare, you know, the, the, the deadline is an actual time, certain day, certain time of the day, it's over, but you have all this time to prepare, you've got to be ready to, you know, pull the trigger or not pull the trigger, or do whatever, whatever you did, um, uh, you know, uh, probably, you know, the most difficult one was trading Ryan Smith, uh, highly uh, scrutinized uh, deal, and um, it was one that, again, didn't happen overnight. It was, you know, weeks and months leading up to that that culminated in the, in the decision. Um, you know, one I regret in hindsight just because of, uh, I knew it wouldn't be easy. I knew that, you know, Ryan was loved by the fan base, and and uh, um, that that people wouldn't understand the business aspect of it. So, and the the further that went along, I mean, the hockey player was the hockey player. There, I mean, hey, if Wayne Gretzky was traded, anybody could be traded, and they're not d done for reasons of spite. There, it's a it's a calculated, uh, collaborative decision as an organization, which involves the ownership and 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 many different. Um, participants to get to that point but you know when the fallout is what the fallout is it's like well obviously we didn't calculate that part and 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 so that that you know those moments are highly stressful that happened to be on the night that uh, that Mark Messier's jersey was re retiring we were putting Mark Messier's jersey up which was like whoever thought that was a good a good idea to make make that decision to retire um, Mark Messier's jersey on trade deadline night, and we traded uh, uh, um, Ryan Smith. Uh, it was it was a very highly str I, and I was supposed to go out at center ice and do the I was a master of ceremonies for for uh, Mark's jersey. And uh, you know after I went through what I did, I I said to. Um, you know, to the people that are running our communications department, I said, you're going to have to find someone else that's going to go out to center ice tonight 
because I just, I, I can't pull myself, um, you know, out there. And um, it wasn't a fear, it was a fear factor. It was a, it was a fear factor that, that there might be some, you know, a fair amount of negative connotations towards me. And my fear being the person that I am, that is, I, I might have reacted in not such an appropriate way in return. <laughs> so I was trying to do the best not to, to make Marx, turn Marx night into something that, uh, you know, anything that it shouldn't be. So, uh, I mean, a little side story to that. So, like, literally, I'd say a half hour before the ceremonies were to begin, I went into the dressing room where Mark was getting ready to put his equipment on and go out on the ice. And I told Mark that I wasn't, you know, I, I, I couldn't pull myself together to go out there. And he said, well, I'm not going out then. <laughs> and I said, oh, I thought that was a nice gesture. You know, that's a real friend. And I said, no, I, I, I kind of chuckled. And, and, I, and I said, um, you know, Mark, I know, I, like, listen, I hope you understand. You know, Mac T is going to do it. And I think it's the best given what's happened. And he goes, hey, do what you want, but if you ain't going, I'm not going. <laughs> and he was serious, you know, like I know Mark when he's, when he's serious, and I'm like, oh my goodness, seriously? They're going to have to deal with all this. And I, you know, I, I finally begged him to go out, and, and, and he did go out. Um, and, uh, uh, but then, uh, you know, another side story, uh, Daryl Cates hired uh, uh, Gord Downey in the Tragically Hip to play a, a private evening for Mark at a, at a restaurant in town, and um, uh, we were, Karen and I were good friends with Gord, um, and what an, an incredible person that guy was, and uh, we were big fans of the hip, and, and uh, you know, afterwards, you know, she gave me a pat in the back and said, hey, tough day, but let's go have fun, and I said, I'm not going to see Gord Downey in the hip tonight, I'm going home, and uh, she said, like, what? And I said, yeah, honey, listen, I'm, I'm going home. Uh, I just don't want to be out in public anywhere. And it's the one time in our marriage, we've been married 30 years, that she was like, listen, I need you there. I want you there. And I had to say to her, I said, well, I'm sorry, but I'm going home. So it was like, it was a, it was a, a really tense day. A lot of this, you know, a lot of the behind the scenes stuff that goes on, but, uh, I, I guess in some respect, I, I don't think, I mean, we, our marriage was solid enough. I don't think I was thinking that I was, um, I was uh, you know, putting our marriage in danger, but she, she was very disappointed that I uh, wasn't going to go to that event, but I, uh, I passed on it and went home. And, uh, and then the next day, of course, our kids, little girls going to school, and they're and they're, they were going to Temple in their pretty little outfits and kissing them goodbye, and my wife's standing there, and, and she looks at me and she says, so what should the girls say at school? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she goes, well, you traded Ryan Smith last night. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, like, really? Seriously? I gotta tell my little girls what to say at school? You know, so anyhow. Thank you, Kevin. That's, that's a, a great place to end it because I think one of, the, one of the reasons we wanted to have this conversation is because, I mean, I think most people in the room, and I certainly know it's true of me, I hear the name Kevin Lowe and I think of a guy who's done nothing but win his whole career. And so to hear stories like that, that I think we can all relate to, trying to explain to our children or explain to other people why we made a bad decision or a decision that's unpopular. Um, it was a great decision. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to catch myself there. I, <laughs> I was hoping you'd let that one and go. And I did bring him back. Yeah, you did. You did. <laughs> and so I, I, think that's, I think that's super valuable for all of us. Um, just before we wrap up, I want to put in a plug for uh, our, our next big event, which is with um, Dave Philipchuk, the CEO of PCL. And we know PCL is a big supporter in the community, uh, plays a big role with the Oilers, help build this beautiful facility. Uh, and, and Dave is going to be our Canadian Business Leader Award winner this year. Uh, we haven't done that event in a while. We're bringing it back after a few years. Uh, so that's happening on March 23rd. 
we've sold a lot of tables, um, but there's a few left and a few tickets left. So if you're interested in attending that, I think that'll be a really uh, entertaining uh, and enjoyable night. The last thing I want to say, I've, I've been sitting here and I've, there's a lot of these really great, um, inspiring quotes up on the wall. But I, I think my very favorite one, as I've, as I've read through them, is 90% uh, of hockey is mental and the other half is physical. So <laughs> I'm going I'm to leave us with that one. And uh, thank you all very much. And thank you, Kevin. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and um, um, and showing so your support. Obviously, the U of A and and uh, the Oilers in some respect. Uh, I'm not sure if if any of you have had the occasion to be in this room. This is called Studio 99 before. Uh, they sort they serve a wonderful buffet pregame, uh, so it's a great environment. If you didn't get a chance to see all the, the pictures in here, they're in, in this little room, there is, as you mentioned, the Warhol. There's a couple Leroy Neiman's, uh, who was a va very famous, uh, uh, um, uh, I would say, uh, a bit of an abstract artist, I guess, but uh, very famous. He used to did caricatures for Playboy magazine way back uh, when we all read it for the articles. <laughs> <clears throat> um, but uh, one of Wayne's best quotes isn't up there, where he said that, uh, you know, wasn't a really physical player, and <clears throat> and he used to tell everybody that uh, you know, you know, in terms of the reference of going in the corners and fighting out, he said, "Wow, well, corners are for bus stops." <laughs> uh, but uh, and, and and relative to, uh, I just wanted to touch a bit. I feel uh, feel terrible for everybody who was looking forward to see the Oilers practice. I suspect that uh, they're leaving for Pittsburgh today. And um, they, they did look tired last night. They, they, they didn't have much jump in the first two periods. And, and, and luckily, the, the, uh, the excellence of McDavid uh, really, and a good save by Skinner late in the game, got to a point where it was a much needed win against a really not a great team uh, that played the night before. So I suspect that factored in. But uh, you're going to get down below. Uh, uh, we will try, I'm, I'm going to go down and check to see what's going on in the dress room and, and if it's uh, available that we could do a, sort of have a quick in and out through the room so everybody can see. The, the room is quite fabulous. It's, it's by far uh, the best dress room in the National Hockey League and I don't say that because you, a lot of you people are sitting here and they go, well, how would even know what the best one is? We've never seen the others, but I can. <laughs> uh, and again, due to Daryl Cates, I'll tell you a little story about the, I mean, I, I really, you know, I, I, I didn't, I did, really didn't have a higher education. I took some university courses when I played junior, but I had the good fortune of turning pro when I was 20 years old and, and uh, always thought I'd go back to university, but uh, I went from you know, from playing to coaching to, to managing to becoming president. Uh, so I like to think that I've sort of had an executive MBA, but uh, without any f f official certificate. Uh, but uh, I really did uh, play a, um, a, a fairly major part in the construction of this building. I sat in in all the planning meetings, uh, or many of them. I had the, you know, the ability to do that. And particularly on the, on the, um, on the hockey operations part, uh, the areas, and, and in particular the dressing room. And I'll tell you a little story. So the dressing room is about 30,000 square feet, by far the biggest in the National Hockey League. And, um, and uh, the, of course, the dressing room is at event level floor, or event level on the floor. And, um, uh, you know, th this is a, a multi-use building, right? There are lots of concerts and events and, and, and sports uh, entertainment. And uh, <clears throat> a lot of business is generated out of the... Out of, out of the, out of the uh, out of the building. And in the concerts in particular, you know, efficiency in terms of, uh, of what goes on at event level is really critical in terms of, you know, attracting uh, uh, um, acts. You know, if you do a great job for the Madonnas and the biggest acts in the world, uh, they will return. And so the, the building was designed with that in, in, in place. But in the meantime, so, so uh, I'm, I'm getting to a point here. <laughs> The event floor, there's only so much square footage. And of course, Daryl Cates wanted to 
he wanted to make a statement in the dressing room because we did, we did have, and we still have challenges, uh, a lot less now that we have Connor McDavid in this wonderful facility, facility, but we did have challenges attracting players, particularly American players, to come to Edmonton, and not just the weather. And um, so Daryl thought he was gonna, you know, eliminate one thing off of the, 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 the checklist for athletes if they were, you know, choosing us instead of us choosing them. And that was the dressing room facility. So really went over the top to do it correctly. As we advanced and, um, you know, so the, 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 the event floor was being allocated for space, the operations people, you know, came to me and said, listen, we don't have enough space. We, we need more space for operations. You know, uh, it's all about the P&L and the bottom line. And if we can do things efficiently, you know, obviously the owner is going to be happy. Uh, the owner didn't, he wasn't buying that. And um, so at one point I said, well, listen, he's not going to know. We'll lop off 5,000 feet at the west end of the building. Uh, they didn't need a ton more space, but they needed some for offices, et cetera, et cetera. So I said, we'll just lop off 5,000 square feet. He's not even going to know. And we're still going to have the greatest facility in the league. But somehow the word got to him. And it's one of the only times that he ever kind of gave me a little bit of hang. And he said, I don't want you touching that. I want it that size. It's important to me. I think it's important to our organization that we have it as it is. So, so the reason why it's the biggest and the best is that no other team will ever replicate that because no other owner will allow, allocate that much space <laughs> to, to, to the professional athletes because you know if they allocate more space, I think you get the gist of it a little better for the bottom line and right. a lot of people are motiv motivated by the bottom line. Not that he's not, but uh, the hockey part was really critical to him. That's great. That's a fantastic story. So, so I'm going to see if we can get a, a quick jaunt through there. I'm going to run down there we'll, we'll as you finish up. up here. Yeah, we'll definitely do uh, a, a tour. We'll get down to ice level. Um, hopefully, we'll, we'll get in to see the dressing room. That sounds exciting. Now, it's a big build-up, so... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've already disappointed everybody once today, yeah. Kevin. <laughs> but... I have to say, as, as, a, as a kid who grew up in northern Alberta watching Kevin and the Oilers of that generation play and win, it's been uh, quite a treat to be up here with one of my heroes today. Um, uh, it's been a lot of fun. I'd be happy to do this every day, but we probably can't do that. We will try and come back uh, sometime in the future and maybe catch a practice when we're here next time. Uh, but thank you all for, for taking this morning and, and coming out and, and listening to us as well. Thank you very much.